when we say, and the philosopher of Agnes says that the catastrophe is you. The human being is uncanny. You think, you think Hurricane Irma's a problem. You are the problem. You're the catastrophe. So, meaning that there is this turning within yourself. And this is what I say is when you look at the disaster, you say that disaster out there is extimate, meaning that it's in me as well. So, consult tries to fix the disaster in me by fixing the disaster out there. Or we come to know it through that. And as students, that's our real goal of our learning. So, so the great art historian Hubert Damisch wrote this book called The Judgment of Paris, and it's about this motif, it's about this theme of these three. And in, in this case, it's mythological version of the trio. So there are three goddesses, Greek goddesses, and they are arguing the gods. Man, they're arguing over which one is more desirable. They're all desirable, but they're arguing over which one's more desirable. So Athena says she's most desirable because of wisdom. Hera, wife of Zeus, says no, she's more desirable because she offers political power in the realm of the polis of custom. Well, political power. Aphrodite says she's more desirable because she constitutes fertility and sexuality. And, of course, they can't decide it, so they said, we'll get a mortal. We'll ask Paris of Troy to judge. And he will award the golden apple to Miss Goddess, Miss Most Desirable Goddess, whatever. And, you know, this Paris, you know, come on, dude, do not take that job. But, you know, yeah, okay. Uh, and now uh, they bribe him, and Aphrodite bribes him with Helen of Troy, right? Uh, most beautiful mortal woman, and Paris awards her the golden apple. Now that's a catastrophe. That's, you know, this is called, you know, this is the basis of tragedy, uh, you know, Ate, which is, Ate is, you know, or it's a, it's, you know, it's, <clears throat> It's a stupidity, if you like, committed by an individual. But for the community in which that individual is, it's a calamity, it's a catastrophe. So, you know, think Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. It's stupid. It's Ate, right? I was overwhelmed. Okay. Um, so that's the mythological version. A philosophical version, and so we say Athena, Hera, Aphrodite, these are Scarecrow, Lion, Tin Man, in their mythological version. Now, Plato has a version of this in the Republic. The Republic, his dialogue, capital of literacy, utopian city. And here he has the insight to correlate these three virtues. I'm going to call them the three virtues, three capabilities, three faculties. He correlates them with social classes. So he gets both the microcosm and the macrocosm. And you can think about this in our own world. So he says, a human being individually may be understood in terms of three powers, three faculties, the head, you know, reason, the heart, will, and the viscera, the appetites, desire. And he says, the rulers are the head. So in the individual, that's the individual, the rulers are the head in the city, the guardians are the heart, and the workers are the appetites. And the proper order among these three is that the rulers run the show, the head runs the show, reason runs the show. That's the proper order. Now, that's his choice. His choice is not Aphrodite. But what he does say is, these things are interrelated within the community and within the individual. And this is the catastrophe, is we can't Interrelate them, interrelate. But here's what Plato tried to be persuasive, and he was very persuasive historically, if you think about it. But he says, sure, it starts with orexis. It starts with appetite. It starts with 
Desire starts with physical love, sexual desire, attraction for Aphrodite, but doesn't end there. Once you have experienced that attraction, you notice the context in which fertility matters, then you realize you're in the realm of Hera, which is to say the realm of the polis, the realm of custom. So you ascend a level in the stack and you go up to that level of the city and of society and of custom. And then when you're in that context, you notice, well, wait a minute, there's one more level in the stack, another level of ascent, and that is to uh, the understanding of the form itself of beauty. Let's say the, you know, the beauty of Aphrodite, the beauty of the family in the city, and then the beauty itself. That's a concept. The Greeks invented that. The concept of beauty without any of the particulars, but in the abstract principle of proportion, of ratio. That's true beauty, lasting, permanent, universal. Uh, that's the proper order. They go together, yes, but in that hierarchical stack. Uh, Aristotle made a little variation on that, and he said, yes, the virtues are theoria, theoria, which is thinking. That's the laws of nature, what's necessary. There's praxis, which is doing. Uh, and praxis cannot be scientific. It's ethical, it's ethics, it's politics. It can't be scientific because it includes human choice. And there's no necessity in human choice. Clinton or Trump. I mean, there's no determinism. There's no necessity that, you know, we elect one or the other. It's human choice. And then finally, there's poesis, which is making or craft. So it's thinking, doing, making. These are the three powers that human beings and societies possess and everything that happens concerns the arrangement among these three powers. So according to Aristotle and within literacy, Aristotle says entities become what they are over time. So he says being is actually in the world. Aristotle, Plato thought being was outside the world he couldn't quite figure out how being got together with becoming, you know, with matter. How did form and matter get together? Uh, and that was Korah. He introduced Korah, which is his third dimension, interests me a lot, uh, which is relation, uh, generative relation. Uh, but Aristotle thought that being is not outside of becoming. Be being is in matter. Categories are in the world and are developed over time. There's a teleology by which something becomes what it is, its essence. And this is of being is, some, is also an invention of literacy. To be a, the possibility of thinking about what is uh, in terms of this definition of true and false, telling what is and what is not the case. So being is in the world. So an acorn becomes an oak over time. A, a kid becomes a goat over time. Things become what they are. And I wrote my book, Avatar Emergency, a couple of you have read, uh, is all about about this, um, <clears throat> becoming, um, becoming what you are, becoming what one is. Uh, so then the question is raised, well then, what is the essence of the human being, such that we may become what we are? And the answer is happiness. Happiness is the essence of human being. How? So, but the problem is, the tricky part for the consult, is happiness is achieved only collectively in the city, uh, requiring choice. And then the implication of that historically has been, oh, well, then happiness is an artifact that can be manufactured through techne. And that has led us to the Gestell, Heidegger would say, of <clears throat> everything in the world being standing reserved for production. We're trying to technologically produce happiness. But that was a misunderstanding, because obviously <laughs> it didn't work. Uh, <clears throat> so we got a variation at the beginning of Electricity on this theme in Immanuel Kant. And he says, well, let me move the categories again. 
for Plato, the categories were outside the world. For Aristotle, they're in nature. I'm going to say the categories are in the human subject. That is, being, uh, the categories of the real are subjective and relative to the finitude of the individual person. And they are what makes experience possible. So, <clears throat> he proposes three critiques, right? And again, here we are, and these are the three. The scarecrow, we have the critique of pure reason, what is understanding what's necessary. Then we have the critique of practical reason, which is moral freedom, free will. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is, Kant thinks this is, you know, religion's responsibility. And there's an utter and complete chasm between understanding what's necessary and free will of moral choice. So you can say, I don't care. I know that everyone dies, but still, I believe in my power of free action. Uh, and, and as we know, institutionally, there's this difference between science and religion is profound. So then Kant's solution was, there's a, he takes poesis, the third critique of the, the aesthetic of taste, and he promotes it to a faculty of equal power with the other two, with reason and praxis. And says, um, <clears throat> there is this aesthetic, sensory, visceral imagination, uh, which is the intuitive power of the individual person to recognize beauty uh, and that is what mediates between pure and practical reason uh, and it operates by pleasure and pain in the form of beauty it operates by attraction and repulsion by in the sublime and it is this capacity now here's the crucial thing for understanding electricity and consult so, electricity, as an institution, and as a metaphysics, and as an apparatus in every way, takes up this human capacity of attraction and repulsion. Not just attraction, attraction and repulsion, just as literacy took up the force of true and false, and just as orality concerned itself with right and wrong behavior. And here's the challenge though. So when we're thinking about electricity, when we think about the institutions of electricity and its metaphysics, we understand that electricity is not concerned with true and false. It's not concerned with right and wrong. It's concerned with attraction and repulsion. So the institution of electricity is the corporation. I'm not going to go into the whole history of that, but it's the corporation, not the school. Now, in, MIT is an interesting case because it's a corporation, that's a university. So, hmm. Okay. Um, but, you know, so we're going to think about that. I want to move along a, a little more here. But so, so Kant's catechism would be the catechism of the three companions of Dorothy. What can I know? What should I do? What may I hope? That's his, his catechism. That's theopraxesis. So the idea is of theopraxesis, theoria, theoria, praxis, poesis, in one word. And we say the consult, the educated person, is concerned with theopraxesis. That is, you can't leave any of them out. How do they go? How do they go together? The catastrophe is that we don't find a way to correlate these, these virtues. Now let me give you one more piece of this trio. So we're saying that the allegory that we're concerned about is showing us something about how one gets a brain, how one gets a heart, how one gets viscera, uh, how they become potent, powerful. So uh, in terms of applied virtues in design, uh, I was interested to read Alan Kay, uh, who 
is the designer credited with inventing graphical user interface in the 1970s in Xerox Park. And Alan Kay is a pretty smart guy, and he's reading he's reading Piaget, he's reading Jerome Bruner, he's reading Vygotsky, he's reading Marshall McLuhan. And they're working on interface with the computer, and he says, you know, you gotta engage the three faculties. So yeah, there's a symbolic dimension, which is the scarecrow, which is coding, keyboard, theory, put that in there. But there's also the inactive dimension of doing the gesture, and that's the mouse. And then there's the aesthetic dimension of the windows and the icon, that's the image. So the idea that the interface would engage all three of the companions, that is to say, symbolic, inactive, and, and image, uh, was built into the computer interface uh, in Alan Kay's design and taken up as you know and popularized and now is in every system. But we want to understand that what lies behind our, our coding, our windows and our mice is this whole entire civilizational struggle with the relationship among the three virtues. So I want to take this into another another level now. I'm talk about the stack because something is not as clear in our allegory of Oz is the stack that the world that Oz is a stack. And I'm using that word stack because. Uh, there's a wonderful book I highly recommend by Benjamin Bratton called The Stack. It was published not too long ago, I think by MIT actually. Uh, but he talks about, he's a really, really good account, very useful account of electricity uh, in, from the point of view of the dimension of technology especially. But he says, uh, you and I are now living in this digital civilization. Unfortunately, he doesn't use the word electricity. But anyway, um, so six six levels, you know, vertically stacked, <clears throat> beginning with Earth, cloud, city, address, interface, and a user. And this stack is immensely complex. It's global. Uh, interrelated, ecologically networked world system. Um, and console is a mode of learning that is meant to function with the stack. And I like the fact that Benjamin wrote, Benjamin Bratton wrote this big fat book because I don't have to. And in fact, I couldn't write that book. He knows a ton of stuff I don't know. But what I can say is, all right, that's electricity. That's the technological condition of the polis and electricity, and console is a way to learn in there. Now, what console especially is concerned with there are those those highest two dimensions, which is the user and the interface. So console is a way to think about you as a user, and your interface with the with, with the rest of the stack. And what and what Brian says is that okay, as complex as the stack is. And it works at the speed of light, is that the interface has to be really simple. The stack's complex, but the interface is simple. So what I'm saying is I'm going for simple. So the console is simple. Uh, but it has to be such that it's, it's simple in a good way. Uh, it has that, that power of, of functionality uh, so that the user thrives and is capable of happiness. Uh, so, 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 what is that? What is that simplicity? And so, we think about. So, we're thinking about console. Our 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 stack is a little a little simpler. It has four. Really, it has four 
levels um, and um, and these um, these four levels are constituted by the apparatus, the history of the apparatus. So we're saying that you as a user uh, have recapitulate uh, in your individual being and as part of your uh, trio of virtues, you recapitulate the entire history of the apparatus from the Paleolithic to today. Uh, and I like the idea of the scenario. So one of the things I like about, you know, this scenario of the Wizard of Oz is not, that's a screenplay, but you know, scenario is this looser genre. So you might think about it for the tale, if we think about the cat, if we talk about that, but the tale of our consult that we're inventing is a scenario form, which is to say it's a very um, uh, exploratory, uh, tentative, sketches, dialogue, you know, description, some pieces of action, some imagery, some collage, whatever, put it together. You know, you think about think about the scenarios, think about the journals and, and notebooks of, of and the artists today, perhaps, would be a way to think about what we're doing here. But, uh, but one of the, <clears throat> but one of the things that we want to, to get at is the fact that you, uh, as a user, um, you possess within you uh, this recapitulation, think about ontogeny and phylogeny, this recapitulation of the entire history of the apparatus is internalized within, within you. Um, and, uh, and I want to just, you know, describe that. Um, and uh, to articulate it uh, so that you can identify the fact that uh, you already, you know, if you, if you think about your Kansas, you think about just your everyday life, you know, we, if we talk about, if I unpack the apparatus, tell its whole history and so forth, like it's real complicated and pretty soon everybody's asleep and, and they move on, you know, but, but if you think about, think about it in its everyday life simplicity, if you look around your world, you'll see it, you'll see the whole apparatus right there, because it's still there, it coexists, all four apparatus, all coexist. So the first institution the oldest institution in history is the family, and you're born into a family, and the family was created in the Paleolithic era, and it's the oldest institution we have. Uh, and this is the Ten Woodman, so the Ten Woodman is representing this dimension emblematically in our, in our allegory, uh, he's holding, holding that place. Uh, but think about what you learn in the family, so as the individual, What do you learn? So, uh, you you get control of your body. This is the machine. Your individual corporality. You are weaned from the breast. You stand up and walk. You're toilet trained. You get control of your bowels. You learn to speak. You enter language. And even then, latently, genital development and sexuality begins. So, within the first few years, you get control of your body. And this is an enormously important experience. And, and actually, I'm going to emphasize it a little bit. So, like, you get a PhD in the visceral. So, like, by the time, you know, you're four or five, right, you get a PhD in the visceral. Because you introduce to the most important object you'll ever engage with, and that's the transitional object that's called. The transitional object is neither inside nor outside, or is both inside and outside, and it's a relationship between you and the caregiver, the mother, the child and the mother. And if you like, the whole Christian religion is like made that sacred, Mary and Jesus. Like, that's it, it's the whole thing. Stop right there. You know. We say, well don't stop there. Uh, but we're saying that this uh, now, I mean, in terms of, so, this is so important because when we get into electricity, we discover, you know, like Walter Ong, the great, great scholar Walter Ong, uh, book Orality and Literacy, which I highly recommend, you know, I got the idea for introducing the term electricity, which is this combination of electricity and Derrida's trace, I got the idea for the, that we needed the term electricity to describe this new apparatus 
uh, the last 300 years from Walter Ong, who said there's orality, there's literacy, and then he said there's secondary orality. What I realize now, and I haven't looked at this a lot, is that actually it should be called secondary paleolithic. Because what we're really doing is going back to, I realize I have to take into account this, this more, even this older apparatus, the paleolithic. Uh, as you think, well, what are, you know, in the collective level, what did the paleolithic give us? Well, for one thing, they gave us a stone tool, stone axe. I mean, it's one of the things I like the tin woodman to say, this tin woodman represents this, because they gave us a stone axe, hand eye, chopping of the tool, but they also gave us the plasmatic line of depiction. And you just look at those caves, Chauvet, Lascaux, those amazing drawings. And when you read about the history of that, and I know other people have probably talked to you about this, but when you read about the history of that, so the invention of the line, of the, the lion in the cave and so forth, that's an invention just like alphabetic writing. Because when you read about that, so read about, you, you find those caves, and it goes back 70, 80, 90,000 years, and there's a bunch of just little scratches and chips and all this crap, and about 40,000, 40, 50,000 years ago, suddenly there were drawings. And there were drawings everywhere. These amazing drawings. And what happened was, in the account is, it was Heurites, they found. It was like, at some point, some guy's banging around, chip, chip, you know, whatever, you know, doing a thing. And it's like, whoa, that thing looks like a buffalo. Holy shit. Come and you know, it's like, the line of depiction was discovered and bam, spread everywhere. Just like the printing press, I mean, within 10 years, he had like 10 million books or something. I don't know, that, that's not true. But a lot of books in Europe. Uh, it happens fast once you get it. So, um, so in any case, so they pass that along uh, to to literacy. But I'm, I'm emphasizing this because when we think about what's happening in literacy, we're trying to recover the visceral in the context of the apparatus of attraction and repulsion uh, to access that visceral PhD. Because the site of human creativity, everyone agrees. You read any account of creativity, it's that transitional object is the key to ability to be a creative person. And uh, it's, it's the, the side of vitality. So the plasmatic line is as ontological as the verb to be in literacy. I mean, it has that quality of life, of vitality, of livingness. And it's in that depiction of the alive, the animated, that is the ontological explanation of purities. So, one of the reasons I'm so deeply interested in post-structural psychoanalysis is because post-structural psycho, post psychoanalysis is a theoretical account of the visceral. And it describes the breast and the, well, Kahn's got that wonderful word for turd, but I can't remember. It is. It's, anyway, the feet, you know, turd, <laughs> you know, uh, and so on. these are part objects, and they circulate outside of the body, in uh, in the culture, in rhythm, and in line, and in sound, and in movement, and so forth. And, it's, and then, so then, modernist arts are an attempt to reconnect with that vitality. And so when you look at modernist arts, it's like in the Renaissance, artists look back to the Greco-Roman tradition that had been forgotten during the old medieval era to, to renew and refresh and, and rediscover form and proportion and so forth. Well, modernist arts turn to the art of children, the art of so-called savages or primitives, the outsiders, the insane, non-Western cultures, in order to recover that visceral attraction repulsion. So when someone would say to Picasso, oh, my four-year-old could do that, and Picasso says, thank you, thank you. It's the greatest compliment I've ever had. Your four-year-old could do that. That's exactly what I was going for, you know. Uh, and it's, it's, to, it's, it's, it's to get that. So 
Uh, so just to emphasize that, I'll be a little, little quicker on these others. So, all right, so you're in a family, all right? So you're learning, you got your visceral PhD, uh, and you're moving on. Uh, but it also tells you what a catastrophe that we do nothing with that. Like we talk about people not getting educated, you know. I mean, abused children and, totally, you know, no care and blah. Anyway, but another question. But so the next thing you notice, and it depends one or another, but let's say you're in this family and uh, they take you to church, maybe. You get christened, go to Sunday school, uh, and that kind of stuff. Now, what's really going on there, whether you're not, whether or not you're religious, and it doesn't matter which religion, because the all religions there, you're getting the metaphysics of religion, uh, and there you are in your everyday life, and you're in Kansas or wherever, and there's a church down the street, or you went to a church. But one way or another, you got the principles of how to behave, what's right and wrong. And what's right and wrong comes out of this religious metaphysics. Uh, why can't I kill the teacher after she gave me a C minus? It's wrong. Otherwise, you could do it fine, but it's, you know. Um, so, um, so we should say, okay, that's, that's there. And, and, um, and specifically the virtue that religion is responsible for in our history, you know, at least in, you know, last couple thousand years, maybe the religion of the book, but Hannah Arendt actually credits St. Paul with inventing the will. Because theologically, um, for salvation has to be earned, um, one has to choose, one has to have free will. So St. Paul says there is such a thing, it's free will, you can choose. Um, but, but, but more generally, um, you know, we're just saying that, so that institution is there, that tradition is there, that metaphysics is there. Uh, we know that there are a lot of problems in the relationship between religion and this next institution, but so I say, all right, you got your family, you get some relationship with religion one way or another, and then you go to school, age four or five, you learn to read and write, you learn evidence-based thinking, you learn logic, uh, you learn how to tell the difference between right and between true and false, um, and you know, all, all of that. So, um, there's one more institution, actually it probably comes pretty quickly, and that's electricity. How do you encounter electricity? You encounter it through the media. You got, you know, pediatricians are really worried about screen time, right? You're not supposed to have more than an hour or two of screen time a day before you're two years old. Otherwise, brain damage, <laughs> you know what you say. Or maybe that brain damage is like, hey, naked ape, you know, you get, you need to be, you know, uh, ADHD or something in order to be electric. I don't know, but we'll see. But, but the point is that you encounter, because uh, what is electricity as an institution? Electricity, the institution of electricity is, a, is the corporation, specifically the entertainment corporation, uh, especially. And here, this is the wizard. So in our allegory, the Wizard of Oz is Walt Disney, if you like, or Byron and Bailey. You know, because, you know, and you know what happens, like, he's got this big machine and everything, he's like, whoa, it's a great voice, and everybody's like, whoa, it's terrifying and such. And in total, the little dog, the animal that therefore I am, Darryl, I would say, a little, total little dog, like, pulls the screen back and, like, and there's a little bald hair guy, you know, like, bald guy, and he's a little, little guy, and he's like, ah, you know, you caught me, you know, yes, I'm a humbug, you know, it's all an illusion and everything like that. Uh, but just an illusion? I mean, it's this dimension of fantasy that uh, is empowered technologically uh, as a crucial dimension by which human beings uh, may come into the experience of happiness. Uh, it's through fantasy that we can play. I mean, so you, like the whole seminar on anxiety it says, you know, <laughs> anxiety and fantasy uh, are this pair. Uh, but uh, but if you think about, so where, how does electricity manifest itself in the built world? I mean, it is the theme park. It is Las Vegas. It is the mall, you know. 
and we have this whole dimension of experience design, which is service design, which is a really crucial dimension of design today, uh, to design actually entertainment experience. And then you maybe have heard this book, Jihad versus Make World. So there is a war. Now, so here's the here's a sort of paradox or conundrum or enigma of the catastrophe. And it is that uh, you can see what we're saying is that. Uh, so by the time you're, let's say, five years old, you have encountered and have become native to every one of four institutional metaphysics and languages in the stack. Family, you know, religion, school, and entertainment. And you can imagine your everyday life. You just move around among these things, right? You say, oh, well, um, after school... I'm gonna, I'll hit the church supper, and then I'm going to the movies, you know, etc. Um, and they all kind of seem to go together. But writ large, at the level of of the institutional histories, these institutions are at war. So there's a reason why jihadis attack tourist sites. There's a reason why 9-11 attackers destroyed the Twin Towers, which is, you know, the emerald city of corporate capitalism. Um, they hated that more than they hated MIT. They didn't try to take out MIT. Um, and just to take that as a more more extreme case. Uh, but but it, what we're also saying that is that within within ourselves, these uh, capabilities are at war. Uh, our desires, and in fact, we think about the modality. So, with reason, you understand what needs to be done. And with will, you know, you have the will to act. But there's another modality which is visceral, which is to be able. To act on that understanding. And where we seem to be stuck is this to be able. Impotence, potency, potentiality. And it is this virtual, say in Deleuze's terms, this virtual versus actual, uh, this potential, this potentiality is the dimension of metaphysics in, in electricity. Being able to imagine the world in a different, in an alternative way. And so, the, and the challenge of consult then is to foster this imagination. But what's needed is original thinking. Um, I mean, you know, we're saying more science, great, go for it. But look what's happening in the corporate world. The corporate world of attraction and repulsion supplies your needs. Like the purest example of a corporation is a drug gang. You know, this is what the enemies of capitalism have always said. El Chapo, you know, uh, is, you know, a good representative of a corporation. Walt Disney's, you know, a little nicer guy. But, um, but the point is that what corporations do is supply the viscera with what it wants. You know, so that's why I say the drug gangs are a really good example. People want drugs, and they're going to get drugs, okay? Um, and, you know, and I'm going to supply those drugs. Now, right now, you're putting me in jail, you know, because you don't like it or whatever, but, you know, someday I'll be the Galileo of, of electricity, and you'll be say, oh, look, El Chapo was the hero, you know. Uh, people were trying to put him in jail, but he was actually just giving people what they wanted, which is to say drugs. Um, that's that's the visceral, right? Wrong, true, false, whatever, you know. So that's in in its in its pure form. Uh, so so we have this this challenge, um, and you know I could go into that. I'm trying, what, what, how are we doing on time here? Yeah. So maybe I should stop there.